We are seeing a series of summits taking place between heads of the states surrounding the Korean Peninsula. Could this possibly lead to the third DPRK U.S. summit meeting? This is a topic we are going to examine on this week's Peace and Prosperity. As President Moon Jae-in reiterated the need for dialogue to achieve peace, regional powers are stepping up their efforts to hold dialogue to work toward a nuclear-free Korean Peninsula. Chinese President Xi Jinping landed in Pyongyang on June 20th, marking the first visit to North Korea by a Chinese leader in 14 years. During a bilateral summit, North Korean leader Kim Jong-un said he wanted to resolve Korean Peninsula issues with relevant countries with patience. In response, Xi pledged China will play a more active role in the denuclearization process. North Korea state-run media released on June 23rd a photo of Kim reading a letter he received from U.S. President Donald Trump. It's not clear what exactly the letter said or when it was sent. But it appears to have come as a reply to Kim's letter, which Trump touted on June 11th as beautiful. Meanwhile, the G20 summit, which was viewed as a critical event to revive the momentum for nuclear dialogue, was held in Osaka, Japan. Leaders around the world sought to resolve different issues through dialogue, from the U.S.-China trade dispute to North Korea's denuclearization. Nuclear negotiations have been stalled for months over growing differences between Pyongyang and Washington. Will the leaders' renewed commitment to dialogue bring change? As an expert to further discuss these issues, we have Dr. Ko Myung-hyun, Research Fellow at the Asan Institute for Policy Studies. Welcome. Thanks for having me. The first question to you is, of course, uh, Chinese President Xi Jinping's mm. visit to North Korea, which is for the first time in 14 years by the top leader of China. Mm. What do you make of this? Well, it's been a great uh, success for North Korea, but also for China. Uh, first, beginning with North Korea, uh, one of the problems of the recent rapprochement between China and North Korea was that it was an unequal relationship, at least that was a perception by the outside world. Uh, Kim Jong-un went to the China four times to meet with Xi Jinping, right. whereas uh, Chinese leader Xi Jinping didn't reciprocate. So clearly, the relationship had this optics that it was unbalanced. And the, the Kim Jong-un, uh, every time he went to China to meet with Xi Jinping, it looked like a China, uh, the North Korean leader was a supplicant to the Chinese leader uh, to gain favor. Whereas now, it looks like the North Korea-China relationship more on an equal footing. So therefore, the reciprocity somehow was restored. And this probably uh, actually gives a lot of legitimacy to Kim Jong-un regime. So it's a, it's a boost, political boost for Kim Jong-un. Also for China, for I think China has been uh, standing on the sidelines uh, side when it comes to the US DPRK negotiations. Of course, China was a major supporter for, the, for North Korea. As, for example, uh, China provided the airplane that Kim Jong-un used to fly to Singapore. So China was, uh, was providing all this uh, political and logistic backing. But at the same time, China looked like a, uh, wasn't like an essential player in the game, so to speak, between uh, the nuclearization game between uh, North Korea and uh, the United States. South Korea was a more, more of an important player then. So I think uh, China as a preeminent power in the region uh, wanted to restore the perception that it was a very influential player. And also the road to Pyongyang actually goes through uh, Beijing. So I think uh, that's been a major, major propaganda success for China as well. Mm -hmm. President Xi's visit to North Korea was marked by a lavish welcome. Here is a short clip. Chinese President Xi Jinping visited North Korea on June 20th, becoming the first Chinese leader to visit the reclusive regime in 14 years. Kim rolled out the red carpet for the Chinese leader during his two-day visit. When they arrived at the Kumsusan Palace of the Sun, 
tens of thousands of colored balloons were released into the air, and another welcome ceremony was held. After a summit meeting and a banquet, she was honored with a special performance of North Korea's mass games titled Invincible Socialism. The performance featured a song by Xi's wife, Peng Li Yun, a former folk singer. The show is believed to have captivated the Chinese president. The red carpet treatment continued as Kim and his wife personally escorted China's first couple to the state guest house. The Kumsuzan State Guest House, a previously unknown name, appears to be a newly built building. During Xi's two day stay, Kim visited his guest house three times, including a visit the next day to take a walk with Xi. Xi returned to Beijing following a luncheon and a farewell ceremony at the airport. Kim was seen waving at Xi's private jet as it lifted off the tarmac. Kim Jong-un mm. surely did roll out the red carpet for mm. President Xi Jinping. And uh, it's very interesting to see him mm. waving at the uh, <laughs> private jet mm. Xi Jinping was taking to return to Beijing. Mm. Uh, how do you assess this summit meeting? Because the reason why I repeat this question mm. is that Will China mm. be able to lift any of the economic sanctions mm. on North Korea after this? Yeah, so your, I think your question is referring to the fact that, I mean, there's a lot of, uh, you know, pomp and a lot of, like, you know, good optics here, right. you know, a lot of, you know, indication that, you what know, What if it's only images? Like Exactly. I think uh, it's more of a form rather than a substance. I mean, clearly, the, the you know, Chinese hands are tied by the international sanctions regime. Uh, China, I mean, there's a reason why China doesn't want to defy the United States in terms of sanctions. And it's because uh, actually China itself as a permanent member of the Security Council has authorized many of the sanctions measures, I mean, more of the sanctions measures uh, currently in place against North Korea. And China doesn't want to undermine the Security Council because mm -hmm. it's a very important way for China to uh, control the you know, American you know, actions around the mm -hmm. world. So clearly they don't want to contract uh, themselves in this regard. So therefore China has to abide by this sanction despite the fact that they are really having a bite in the North Korean economy and North Korea is actually complaining about it mm -hmm. pretty loud. Uh, so yeah, that's why the, I think, I mean, we don't know the actual content of the you know, meeting between Xi Jinping and Kim Jong-un, but we can you know, like, uh, imagine that uh, it was more about reaffirmation of the bond, the historical bond between uh, the two communist countries with so, you know, socialism and market characteristics mm -hmm. and all that. Uh, also, you know, like uh, having an you know, agreement about the future direction of the negotiations between uh, you know, the, in the United States and North Korea. So I think uh, there's a lot of like, you know, confirmation of what we already know rather than any new like, agreement or new like, uh, results. Mm. All right. Of course, the Kim Jong-un has every reason to mm. welcome the mm. confirmations and the assurances mm. that you mentioned by uh, China. Mm. Uh, on top of that, on top of touting close ties with Beijing, mm. Chairman Kim Jong also revealed <laughs> the letter yes. uh, from U.S. Mm. President uh, Donald Trump. Mm. What do you make of this exchange of personal letters between top leaders uh, in Washington and Pyongyang? Well, this is another theatrics going on. Theatrics. Yeah, it's a, it's a different type of theatrics that we have seen in Pyongyang between Xi and Kim. This is uh, another theatrics between uh, Trump and Kim. And the uh, exchange of letters is uh, very like a theatric, I mean, very physical way of uh, uh, sending a message around the world that uh, there's uh, you know, strong personal relations you know, maintained between the two leaders. And the reason why it, uh, Trump and Kim both emphasize the letters, which is kind of, kind of funny in the, the days of email and instant right. messaging, uh, is because um, this is actually real politics. And also it's a way of uh, you know, conducting, I'm sure you know, for Trump especially to connote that you know, he's conducting diplomacy in a very different way. Essentially, he's replacing structure, meaning, like, a, for example, working level negotiations, you know, like using the international institutions and establish the diplomatic institutions such as the State Department to negotiate like a very you know complex and challenging uh, issue like a denuclearization. And he's ex uh, replacing that his own per personal diplomacy, personal style, and therefore he's getting all the credit for any success. I don't think he's think thinking too much about the downside, <laughs> which is like a major failure, but right now he's focused on the success. So mm -hmm. that's the reason why he loves sending letters to uh, Kim Jong-un, and Kim Jong-un is happy to reciprocate. Mm -hmm. 
In fact, this isn't the first time the leaders of North Korea and the United States exchange letters. Mm. And letter diplomacy has helped the two sides find a breakthrough whenever talks stalled. But will it work this time? Here's more on the story. North Korea's Korean Central News Agency reported on June 23rd that North Korean leader Kim Jong-un received a letter from U.S. President Donald Trump. The letter is believed to have come as a reply to Kim's letter sent on June 11th, ahead of the one-year anniversary of the Singapore summit. I just received a beautiful letter from Kim Jong-un. I, I can't show you the letter, obviously, but it was a very personal, very warm, very nice letter. I appreciate it. Kim sent his first letter to Trump last year in June, 10 days ahead of the first historic North Korea-U.S. summit. It played a key role in helping the two sides iron out their differences at the last minute. In the same year, ahead of the 70th anniversary of North Korea's founding in September, Kim wrote another letter to Trump, which laid the foundation for the inter-Korean summit in Pyongyang. The letter that was instrumental in paving the way to the second Kim Trump summit in Hanoi was hand-delivered by Kim Yong-chul, North's top nuclear negotiator at the time, when he flew over to the U.S. in January. Amid stalled talks between Pyongyang and Washington following the failure of the Hanoi summit, another round of letters have been exchanged between Kim and Trump. It remains to be seen whether these exchanges will provide much-needed momentum for a third Kim-Trump summit. As the video clips clearly mm. show that both leaders were mm. really happy about mm -hmm. the exchange of letters, mm. and President Trump called the letter beautiful, <laughs> right? Uh, his uh, usual mm. words. Mm. And uh, Chairman Kim Jong also said that the letter uh, was uh, of excellent content, mm. and he was going to give the most mm. serious consideration. Mm. Mm -hmm. And he even revealed the you know, official picture mm. you know, reading the letter <laughs> from <laughs> Washington. Mm. What's going to happen after this? Well, I think uh, there's some hope that uh, you know, the exchange of letters uh, is going to be an indication that uh, there will be uh, another summit, USDPRK summit, uh, uh, following up. Uh, but I think uh, we are somehow putting too much emphasis on the exchange of letters. So somehow mm -hmm. letters are the cause behind the outcome, which is okay. the summit. I think we're confusing the two. I mean, I think the reason why we, we have seen exchange of letters before the, uh, the, took, uh, the summit took place was because the two leaders were very willing to have the summit. Therefore, they mm -hmm. exchange letters. Mm -hmm. Now, I think, uh, you know, especially President Trump is uh, using it the other way, like, or like Kim Jong-un as well. They're trying to connote, again, uh, that they are willing to meet. But then the problem now is that North Korea has uh, clearly stated there will be two conditions before they are going to engage in the United States diplomatically again. The two conditions are, first of all, the, for the United States to take the step-by-step -step approach towards negotiations, meaning United States and North Korea would have to agree on small measures, uh, small uh, denuclearization steps exchange. Not all for, in one. Exactly. All in, I mean, unlike what President Trump and uh, his national security advisor uh, Burton has mm -hmm. stated, right? So. I think uh, that, that's the reason why you know, North Korea has been pushing for this st smaller step-by-step -step negotiations. Uh, another condition is for the United States to take the first step, meaning showing the goodwill towards North Korea by relaxing some of the sanctions mm -hmm. measures currently in place, probably referring to resumption of the Kaesong Industrial Complex and the Mount Gyeongjang Tourism Project. So I think, uh, I mean, these are very clearly stated conditions, and there's no indication whatsoever especially from Washington, that uh, Washington is willing to uh, lift or meet some of the, at least one of these two conditions. So, I mean, still uh, United States is um, affirming over and over that uh, they want a grand bargaining with North Korea, you know, wholesale denuclearization to be you know, met by the wholesale lifting of the sanctions, uh, as well as uh, there's no inkling whatsoever for the U.S. government to allow South Korea to engage North Korea economically. So it's a little bit doubtful, for me at least, that uh, uh, the letter actually states that the United States is willing to meet some of these conditions. Then if that's the case, it's purely about reaffirmation of their willingness to employ personal diplomacy to solve the problems. Mm -hmm. But I think if that's the case, uh, we're going to have another problem that we already seen in Hanoi, which is things are going to not going to work out at the working level that takes place before the actual summit. And I think uh, if that's the case, there's a you know, pessimistic view would be that uh, this, uh, this attempt to have the sort of summit is not going to crush and burn before they, the, the two leaders actually meet at the working level meeting.
So uh, third summit meeting between Trump and Kim is not likely, mm -hmm. despite exchange of personal letters. That but is likely. beginning of mm -hmm. a working level negotiations mm -hmm. may be possible. Yeah, that's definitely true. I mean, the both sides have been stated over uh, over and over. Mm -hmm. I mean, most recently, uh, uh, you know, Secretary of State of Mike Pompeo, as well as the Steve Began, the Special Envoy to North Korea, have stated that the doors are wide open in Washington to continue with the negotiations. But the problem is. We know from, you know, from the exchange of the letters between the two leaders, from, from the confirmation of this by the, you know, the, dipl the U.S. diplomats, that uh, there's always a willingness to negotiate between Pyongyang and Washington. And we have seen that the two leaders have already met twice already in Singapore and Hanoi, but then there's no progress being made whatsoever. So that's the reason why, uh, despite all these like, you know, good intentions, I think it's unlikely for North Korea and the United States to solve their outstanding mm -hmm. issues at the second meeting, or even the second meeting will take place. Okay, but we cannot really guess the other content of the letters mm. exchanged about between the two mm. leaders, but we can guess what kind of message will be delivered mm. by Chinese President Xi Jinping mm. uh, to U.S. President Donald Trump at G20 summit meeting, uh, because there will be bilateral summit mm -hmm. meeting yeah. in the sidelines of mm. the G20 you know, summit mm. in Osaka, Japan. Mm. So what would constitute the main content of the message or proposal mm. delivered by Xi? Uh, to U.S. President Donald Trump? Well, I think uh, it's very clear. I think it's already... Very clear? Yes, very clear, because I don't think you know, she is going to uh, deviate from the script already written um, by the Chinese leadership in Beijing regarding North Korea. We have seen that uh, Xi Jinping actually sent an op-ed to Nodong Shinmun, the Nodong you know, Workers' Daily in North Korea before his state visit to Pyongyang. And there he uh, you know, like, uh, reaffirms that uh, China supports the North Korea's uh, diplomatic efforts, which is a step by step negotiations. And China also has uh, uh, stated several times that the only way to solve the North Korean problem is by so, you know, so-called uh, the parallel approach mm. towards the denuclearization, which is uh, there should be a peace talks, peace regime at the same time as the denuclearization process. And I think, uh, yeah, I mean, it's been, I mean, the Chinese has been very consistent in this regard. And I don't think of Xi Jinping is going to deviate from that in the G20 meeting in Osaka. So uh, that's the reason why I think a person Xi is going to reiterate, uh, you know, the traditional Chinese position regarding these issues. Um, but then what really matters here is that it's actually President Xi empowered by Kim Jong-un that who delivers this message to uh, President Trump. So I think uh, President Trump is going to get the message that, well, you know, the Chinese leader now has a voice, I mean, actually an access to Kim Jong-un, and maybe I can send the same message through him to Pyongyang. So this is how the President Xi's standing actually goes up here. And uh, whether, when it comes to, you know, overall the, the real, the meat of the matter, I think that's something that uh, will be discussed bilaterally between Pyongyang and Washington. Hmm. Okay. In the meantime, South Korean President Moon Jae-in mm. is also participating in the 20th mm. summit meeting and have a series of uh, sideline mm. bilateral summit meetings uh, with China, mm. Russia, mm. and the United States. Mm. Uh, what kind of role uh, will uh, South Korea can play in order to maintain its mm. uh, status and influence mm. as a booster mm. for the peace regime and the denuclearization mm. effort on the Korean Peninsula? Well, I think uh, President Moon I mean, and South Korea have been the the biggest, uh, you know, like a loser, so to speak, and the, of the Xi Kim summit in, in, in Pyongyang. I mean, you know, Kim Jong-un has been empowering South Korea to be the mediator between them and the United States. Somehow, South Korea would uh, have the role of convincing President Trump to, you know, take the, you know, more, uh, view, view those things from more, you know, matter that's more friendly to the, North, to the North Koreans. And that's the reason why there's been multiple meetings, inter-Korean meetings between Kim Jong-un and uh, President Moon. Mm -hmm. uh, but then with uh, the intervention by China, I mean, especially the press, I mean, the, the rising of the profile by the Chinese leader shows that uh, Kim Jong-un is now empowering the Chinese mm -hmm. to, be, to have the same role that South Korea used to have. So it uh, diminishes South Korea in many ways, this multiple uh, game that's being played by Washington, Beijing, South Seoul as well, but then Washington and mm -hmm. Beijing and Pyongyang. So I think in this game, I think South Korea has a more diminished role. In G20 meeting, sure, like our president is going to have meetings with, uh, you know, with uh, you know, Vladimir Putin of uh, Russia and then side meetings with uh, President Trump and all, all that. But the, the problem here is that uh, I think uh, there's a little, the South Korea, I mean, President Moon 
can do to accelerate uh, the negotiation process between uh, you know, Pyongyang and Washington. Okay. What kind of a uh, message uh, will President Donald Trump uh, deliver to North Korea if he is ever going mm. to visit demilitarized zone during his visit to Seoul? Well, you know, I think uh, President Trump would love to use the DMC as a uh, very Actually, positive... Actually, he tried last time exactly. he came to Seoul, right? Exactly. But it was canceled due to inclement weather. That's right? correct. That's correct. So I think he would love to go back and use the DMC as a very beautiful backdrop. For, for messaging the, to the, no, not to North Korea especially, but to the rest of the world, but especially his support base back in uh, the United States that it's been, it's been the, in the United States, I mean, actually it's been him, uh, President himself, who solved this like, uh, very like, uh, agonizing conflict in the Korean Peninsula and also has been able to open this door to a dramatic uh, change in the relationship between Pyongyang and Washington. It's brought huge, right? Exactly, right. exactly. And they brought stability right. and, and actually certainty to right. the Korean Peninsula. And he's going to like, you know, that's going to be his message uh, and you know, using the DMC as a backdrop. Okay. Once the leaders of regional powers get together and discuss North Korean issues, it will be a critical time for denuclearization talks. Will North Korea return to the negotiating table? We ask this question to some experts to broaden the perspective. 한반도 비핵화 평화 체제를 풀어가기 위해서 트럼프 김정은 두 지도자가 시간이 별로 많지 않고 그 과정에서 좀더 적극적으로 움직일 수 있는 그런 신호를 보내고 있기 때문에 전반적인 상황은 북미 정상회담으로 가는 조기 개최가 가능한 쪽으로 방향을 잡고 있다고 볼 수도 있습니다. 중국이 중재자 역할로 나서고 미국이 적극적인 대북 정책을 취한다면 어, 다시 한번 남북 관계를 중심으로 한반도 정세가 크게 변화할 수 있는 계기가 될 것이라고 생각합니다. 머지 않아 남북 정상회담도 가능할 것이라고 생각합니다. Let's took up the uh, final comment made by the second expert mm. um, linking mm. the G20 summit meeting mm. as a success and resumption of inter-Korean mm. summit between President Moon Jae-in and North Korean leader Kim Jong-un. Uh, I think the trends uh, uh, the, uh, leading up to uh, the G20 meeting and the aftermath of the G20 meeting indicates that the North Koreans don't have a strong incentive to re-engage South Korea in a major way, like having a, another like a inter-Korean summit. Uh, we have seen uh, from the you know, North Korean statements expressing strong, um, I would say, uh, I mean, like a negative feelings, so to speak, okay. about South Korea. That's a nice way of <laughs> exactly <laughs> describing it. Yeah, negative feelings <laughs> of, to to South Korea because South Korea's unwillingness to, uh, you know, go beyond the sanctions and engage in North Korea economically, uh, for example, unilaterally restarting the Kaesong industrial complex and so forth. So, and then you know, there's been a lot of complaints from the North Korean media about South Korea, and and that I think that's uh, one of the reasons why. Kim Jong Un received uh, received uh, President uh, Xi Jinping with such an open arms and and a dramatic welcome and all that. I think he he wants to send a message not just to Beijing but also to Seoul and Washington that now North Korea is willing to play this geopolitical game and willing to be the one of the pawns for the Chinese game mm -hmm. with the United States. So and then therefore they are empowering the Chinese Chinese leader here. So then now uh, there's like a juxtaposition. I'm not like a there's a contradiction. I mean, North Korea could diversify its diplomatic efforts by reaching out to South Korea too, but then that kind of, you know, like uh, diminished the gesture that North Korea made, just made to the Chinese. Mm -hmm. So I think uh, for now, they're going to stick to, uh, uh, you know, the, you know, strengthening the relationship with, the, with China, also try to restart the diplomatic uh, negotiation with Washington, mm -hmm. but then remain cold towards Seoul. Mm -hmm. And I think, uh, uh, I mean, you know, because especially because the prospect of uh, the third uh, U.S. DPK summit is not as likely as uh, the perception, prevailing perception now. So, I mean, if there's the the chance of the U.S. DPK is uh, is not likely, then therefore the chance of the another inter-Korean summit is also not likely. Mm. All right, very interesting. Uh, Dr. Go, uh, thank you very much for sharing your insight on broad range of issues today. My pleasure. Peace and prosperity has examined so many important changes in Northeast Asia. Here's a news update.
Early on Saturday, U.S. President Donald Trump offered a spontaneous invitation to North Korea's Kim Jong-un. On the day of his arrival to Seoul for a two-day summit with South Korean President Moon Jae-in, Trump says he wants to meet with Kim to shake hands and say hello in the demilitarized zone dividing the two Koreas. He tweeted, while there, if Chairman Kim of North Korea sees this, I would meet him at the border slash DMZ just to shake his hands. Put out, I just thought of it this morning. Uh, we'll be at uh, the area we may go to the DMZ or the border, as they call it. So uh, we'll be there. And I just put out a, uh, a feeler because I, I don't know where he is right now. He may not be in North Korea. But I said if, Cam if Chairman Kim would want to meet, I'll be at the border. It's certainly uh, we seem to get along very well. Presidents Trump and Xi agreed to resume trade talks that broke down in May and to stop imposing new tariffs for now. At the news conference in Osaka, Trump added that the U.S. will give China a list of agricultural goods to buy. China state-run Xinhua News Agency also reported that the two sides agreed to restart trade negotiations and that the U.S. will not impose new tariffs. Another agreement was struck regarding Chinese tech firm Huawei. We will shed more light on this matter next week. And that's all we have for you today. Thanks for watching.